pleasure today to introduce to you our next guest speaker, Mr. Arun Gandhi. I don't think he needs much of the introduction, you know. He's the fifth grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. And I'm very proud to know that Mahatma Gandhi came to Zanzibar, the place I was born. And my father had the privilege to meet him as a child. And the other privilege he had is that uh, when Gandhiji did die, his ashes were cremated throughout the world. Yeah. And my father was the recipient of those ashes. So we have some really you know, good memories. Um, my father was a big believer in nonviolence. He always practiced that. And I think that's what he instilled in all of our children, you know, all his children. I uh, wanted to talk something about uh, Mahatma Gandhi a little bit, that Albert Einstein, a famous physicist, once says that we would rarely see a person like Gandhiji walking on the face of this earth. And it's a rare thing. So we are very honored to hear the words from our, our great physicist. Um, Mr. Arun Gandhi was born in Durban, South Africa. He said at a very young age he was exposed to racism by both the whites and the blacks in South Africa. And you know, I'm sure I'll let him tell you the story, but he did at the age of uh, 23, you did return to India and worked as a reporter for the Times of India and for Social Unity, whose mission is to elevate poverty and uh, discrimination. Um, I was amazed at the number of books that you've written. I did not even realize until I was Googling, I said, oh my God, I did not know all these books you've written. You've written thousands of articles, you've traveled to so many countries, and I'm sure if Mahatma Gandhi was alive today, he would be very proud of your accomplishments, that you have really followed his path. So, you know, it's, a, it's a really an honor that you have done so much work. Um, I think it's eight books, or you have written more than eight books, eight books and you've written hundreds of articles. Okay, um, the, what uh, Mr. Arun Gandhi is doing right now is that, that uh, he founded the Worldwide Education Institute in May 2008. And uh, it is to promote community building in uh, depressed areas of the world through the joining of Gandhi philosophy and vocational education for children and their parents. And that's what his uh, recent work uh, you know, is doing. He travels a lot, although he's based in Rochester, and he has a son and a daughter. And your wife passed away in 2007. Yes. I had the privilege to meet her, but I know she had a pretty, arthritis was a big thing, right? Yeah. Uh, she had a pretty severe arthritis, but I met her at the Baha'i uh, Center. Mm -hmm. So, so without uh, further ado, I would ask Mr. Arun Gandhi to come and share his wisdom. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I just arrived from Chicago, where we had a board meeting for the Gandhi Worldwide Education Institution. It's an institution, as you were told, uh, started in 2008. Uh, because there's tremendous amount of poverty all over the world and um, we don't seem to be doing enough for them. And uh, I thought, uh, you know, as a small token of uh, gesture that we will uh, have this education institute and give young children an opportunity to break out of the cycle of poverty. Um, I am a firm believer in um, shooting for the moon, and if you miss the moon, at least you will fall within the stars. And so our ambition with this uh, institute is tremendous. It's a <laughs> very ambitious program. But we, you know, we think that uh, affecting few people also will be uh, enough, and, and you know, if all of us can do that, it will make a very big difference in the world. And this whole idea of the uh, Gandhi Worldwide Education Institute emerged from uh, another program that I've been running for the last 14 years. It's the, called the Gandhi Legacy Tour. And uh, I take people from the United States and other parts of the world uh, on an annual tour of India. And we go and see how people are using Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence to bring about a transformation in society. And it's becoming a very popular tour because we don't do the normal touristy things. We go and uh, see uh, projects in villages and projects in slum areas in, in the cities. 
and compare them and have a discussion. And it's kind of an educational tour. But it was on one of these tours that I was uh, traveling in the city of Mumbai by train, uh, the local uh, train, suburban train. And um, I was standing and reading my book, and suddenly I felt somebody tugging at my trouser leg. And I looked down, and there was this little kid. He couldn't be more than five or six years old. He was dressed in rags. He was dirty from poverty. And um, he had a little tin, full, uh, half full of candy, homemade candy. And he was trying to uh, implore me to buy uh, those candies from him. And I was intrigued, first of all, to see such a little child traveling all by himself on the train and selling candy. And so I uh, asked him to get off the uh, train with me because my station was coming up. And I sat with him at the station and talked for a while. And I learned a very sad story. I learned that he came from a very poor family. They migrated from the village into the city in search of survival. They had, uh, he had three siblings older than him and all of them had to work. And this little boy, every day, was sent out by his mother with this can full of candies, with instructions not to come home until he had sold all the candies and brought the money. And it is only when he brought the money home that he would get something to eat. Until then, he would have to remain hungry or whatever he picked up from the garbage on the streets uh, had to live on that. Now, when I met him, it was about five o'clock in the evening, and he still had half a tin full of candy. And I wondered, I said, you know, when is this child going to eat? It's already five o'clock in the evening, he hasn't sold all this candy. And when is he going to sell all that and when is he going to be able to eat? And I also thought that I can buy all the candy and uh, give him the money that he needs. But that will be something that will help him for that one day. But the next day what's going to happen? Every day what's going to happen to him? And why should children at this young age have to work for a livelihood? and starve all day to earn some money. We are now in the 21st century, and we can't have this kind of thing going on in the world. We need to do something about it. And that is where the philosophy of nonviolence comes in, because it's not just about the non-use of physical force or putting an end to war, it's about a whole lifestyle. It's about our own uh, attitudes. You know, we have over the years built a whole culture of violence. A culture that is so deep rooted in us that uh, we sometimes don't even know that we are being violent. It's taken over our language, it's taken over uh, our relationships, it's uh, our attitudes, our sports, our entertainment, everything is violent. And we enjoy that violence. And that is the sad part of it. That even our parenting has become violent. And with that kind of culture of violence, we are just getting deeper and deeper into the mire uh, that is going to drag us down as humanity and uh, we won't be able to get out of it. And I think the only way to get out of it is to transform that culture of violence to a culture of non-violence. A culture of non-violence that brings out all the good in humanity. The culture of violence oppresses us. We become angry, frustrated, um, uh, violent, greedy, selfish, 
all of these negative things emerge and that's what takes over our life. So today we see our relationships with each other is based on that culture of violence. We are always looking at what am I going to gain from this relationship and if I don't gain anything from this relationship, why should I bother to cultivate it? So it's always that kind of selfish, greedy attitude that motivates us to do things. And we need to get out of that culture of violence mm -hmm. and the culture of non-violence brings out all the good in us. All the love and respect and compassion and understanding and appreciation that needs to come out and, and create a better community and a better um, uh, sense of humanity. And that is what my grandfather always uh, talked about and believed in. Unfortunately, scholars today who have translated his philosophy have looked at only uh, his philosophy in terms of political conflict resolution because the most popular thing that he did was gain, gain independence for India through, without firing a, a bullet. And so everybody has been focusing on how you bring about a resolution of political conflicts peacefully and non-violently. But they have forgotten the deeper sense of the whole philosophy of how we should live our lives so that non-violence becomes more understandable and, and practical. And that is what we need to learn. And I was fortunate that I had the opportunity to live with my grandfather for two years uh, between the age of 12 and 14 when uh, many things that he taught me at that time didn't make a lot of sense at that time. I wasn't a very bright student. I wasn't um, a, a, um, you know, somebody who could understand deep philosophy at the age of 12. But the way he taught it to me, it remained in my mind. And as I grew up and began to reflect on it, I realized the importance of uh, his message and uh, how uh, we need to understand it and live it. <coughs> the one first lesson that he taught me was about anger. You know, he himself learned about anger management when he was a very young uh, man. As you probably know, he was 13 years old when he was married. Both of them were 13 years old. And they started living together at the age of 16. And grandfather says that at that age, he didn't know who the boss was going to be in that relationship. <laughs> <laughs> who was going to lay down the rules and, and uh, enforce those rules. And so he started going to the library and reading books on the subject. And all these books were written by male chauvinists because they all talked about how the husband should lay down the rules and enforce them strictly. So after reading this book, he came home one day and he told grandmothers, from tomorrow you are not going to stir out of the house without my permission. That's the law and you're going to obey it and I want no arguments about it. And grandmother didn't say anything at all. She didn't respond to him, she didn't retort, she didn't do anything, she just quietly went to bed, got up the next day and continued to do what she always did. <laughs> continued to go out and visit and never <laughs> to get grandfather's permission. And at that point, after about three or four days, when he realized that she was not obeying him, he confronted her again and he says, how dare you disobey me? Didn't I tell you that you are not to stir out of the house without my permission? At that point, grandmother very quietly, without raising her voice or getting agitated, <clears throat> very quietly she told him, she says, I was brought up to believe that we must always obey the elders in the house. And I believe the elders in this house are your parents. 
And if you're trying to tell me that I should not obey your mother, but obey you instead, let me know so that I can go and tell your mother I'm not going to obey you anymore. <laughs> and of course he couldn't tell her to do that, and so the whole matter was settled without anybody losing their temper or breaking up the relationship. And that, grandfather said, was the most profound lesson in conflict resolution <laughs> that he learned. And from that point onwards, learning about anger and being able to channel that energy into positive action became the cornerstone of his philosophy of nonviolence. He expected everybody who believed in his philosophy, who wanted to uh, live according to his philosophy, to learn how to deal with their anger uh, positively and constructively. Unfortunately, we ignore this. We don't teach anybody, we don't teach ourselves, we just let everybody decide uh, how to use their anger and the result is that most of us, if not all of us, end up abusing anger. And that is wrong. Now, one thing that we need to understand is that anger is not bad. It is not something that we should be ashamed of or try to suppress. Anger is a beautiful thing, it's a powerful emotion. It is what fuel is to the automobile, anger is to the human being. It gives us the motivation to do what we need to do. But what is wrong is the way we abuse anger. And we should be ashamed of the way we abuse anger. We should learn how to channel it effectively and positively. He told me that anger is like electricity. It's just as powerful and just as useful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use the energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse the energy and cause death and destruction. He suggested that I write an anger journal. He said every time you become angry about something, don't act on it, don't say anything, don't do anything that you are going to regret. But write it all down in your journal. But write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution. Now that is very important. Today a lot of people tell me they have been writing an anger journal for a long time but it hasn't really helped them. <laughs> because every time they go back and read the journal they are just reminded of the incident and they get <laughs> So we don't want the journal to become a reminder of the incident, we want the journal to help us find a solution to the problem there. So it's very important that we write this journal with the intention of finding a solution. I did this for many years and I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to channel my anger into positive action. And I suggest this to everybody that they try it out themselves and uh, see what a difference it makes. Now I was 12 years old when I heard, uh, learned this story, um, lesson from grandfather and I was quite a feisty 12 year old and decided to test him and see whether he himself had learned the lesson or not. <laughs> and this was the time in his life when he was involved in many important things. He was uh, not only fighting the British for India's independence, but he was also concerned about the uh, emancipation of the Indian women, the education of children, the emancipation of the so-called untouchable people. All of these things uh, were very important to him. And he had programs going on in all these different fields. And all of them needed to be funded. And at that time, much of the funding was controlled by the British and they were not willing to con give uh, grandfather any funding. So he had to find ways of raising the money himself. 
and he decided the easiest way for him to raise money was to sell his autograph. And he put a fee of uh, five rupees for each autograph, which in today's currency would be approximately five dollars. And every morning and evening, when he had these interfaith prayer services held in an open space like this or outside under a tree, when hundreds or sometimes thousands of people would assemble for the prayers, they would, most of them would seek his autograph. And it was my duty while I lived with him to go out into the audience and collect the autograph books and the money and bring it to him for his signature. And every, I did this for many days and then one day I realized, I said, everybody seems to be getting his autograph, so why not me? After all, I'm his grandson and I deserve an autograph too. But I didn't have any money to pay him. So I quietly got myself a little autograph book and I slipped it into the pile, hoping that he wouldn't notice the absence of money. But when he came to that book, he said, why is there no money for this autograph? And I said, because it's my book. And he said, well, you should know that I don't make an exception even for grandsons. That if you want an autograph, you will not only have to pay me for it, but you'll have to earn the money and pay me. Don't ask your parents for it. And I said, no way. <laughs> I said, you're my grandfather and I'm going to make you give me this autograph free. And he laughed and said, all right, let's see who wins. <laughs> and from that day, every day, when he was in high-level political discussions with Indian politicians or British politicians, I would barge into the room with my autograph book and thrust it in his face and demand an autograph. <laughs> my logic was that just to get rid of me, he would sign the book and give it to me. But instead, every time I became too boisterous, all he did was put his hands across my mouth pressed my head against his chest and went on talking politics. <laughs> <laughs> on many occasions, the other politicians used to get exasperated and tell Grandfather, why don't you give him the autograph and be done with it? He disturbs our meetings every day. And Grandfather would just smile and say, this is a private joke between the two of us. You don't have to get involved in it. <laughs> The long and short of it is that he never did give me the autograph, but he never ever told me to get out of the room and leave him alone. As we would do with our children or our siblings, if they came into the room when we were working on something important, we shoot them out very rudely sometimes, telling them to get out of the room, can't you see I'm busy? He never did that to me. And that is when I realized that if he was able to control his anger to that extent, if we attempt 50% of it, we will make a tremendous impact on the level of violence that we experience today. So I cannot stress enough how important it is for us to understand anger and being able to channel that energy into positive action. But I also learned from him about the depth and the breadth of his philosophy of nonviolence. Until then, I thought that as long as I don't beat up people or don't fight or get involved in any kind of physical violence, I am peaceful. I don't need to change. I don't need to do anything. But through that little episode, he taught me a powerful lesson which gave me an insight into what his philosophy was. And this happened through a little three-inch butt of a pencil. I was coming home one day from school and I had this notebook and a pencil in my hands and it was about three inches long. And I thought to myself, I deserve a better pencil. This is too small for anybody to use. And so without a second thought, I just threw the pencil away because I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I met grandfather and asked him for a new pencil, 
instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be joking. He said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do. He has a flashlight. <laughs> he sent me out with a flashlight to look for this pencil and I must have spent about two hours searching for it. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world. And because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources and they have to live in poverty. And that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all of these things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that we throw away and waste and destroy or overconsume because we have so much of it, we don't know what to do, that every time we indulge in any of those acts, we are indulging in violence. Violence against nature, violence against humanity, or just plain, simple violence. So we, we need to do introspection to find out how we are contributing to violence in the world. And the way he made me do this introspection was by making a genealogical tree of violence on the same principles as we do a family tree with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that I had experienced during the day. Things that I may have done to other people or people may have done to me, all of that had to be analyzed and examined and put in their appropriate places on that tree. If it was the kind of violence where physical force is used, all the kicking and beating and punching and slapping and wars and killings and murders and rapes, all of these things where physical force is used, that would go under physical violence. But if it was the kind of violence where we don't use any physical force and yet we hurt people, directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, we hurt people by our actions or inactions. Things like discrimination, oppression, suppression, economic, political, social, cultural, religious, all of the hundreds and hundreds of things that we do every day that hurt people somewhere or the other. And the way I had to find out about whether this was passive violence or not was to ask myself the simple question. If somebody were to do this to me, would I feel helped by it or hurt by it? And if I concluded that I would be hurt by it, then that was passive violence. And when I began to do this introspection, I was surprised when I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. The physical violence didn't grow very much because there's a limit to how much physical violence one can do. But the passive violence just grew endlessly. And that is when grandfather explained to me the connection between the two. When we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously, that generates anger in the victim. And the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out that fire of physical violence, 
we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change that we wish to see in the world. It has to be, begin from us. Unless we become the change and unless we bring peace into our life, <coughs> there, we cannot create peace outside. We cannot build something that we don't know what it looks like. And we can only do something when we can create it within ourselves that we will be able to create it outside. So these are some aspects of the philosophy that we all need to understand and remember. And as I said in the very beginning, we have become very selfish, self-centered, greedy, um, angry, frustrated human beings. And we show this every day in our lives. In everything that we do, we're just thinking about ourselves and not about others. We don't care what happens to people elsewhere. But we forget that no nation in the world can live in peace and harmony if the rest of the world is going down the tube. If there's unhappiness or destruction or poverty or, uh, or misery in, in parts of the world, uh, and that is going to affect the whole world. So this myth about nationalism, about building a strong army, and, and preserving our corner of the world and saving our nation. It, it's all a myth. We will not be able to save our nation, however rich we may be or however powerful we may be, if the rest of the world is not saved also. The stability and security of every country depends on the stability and security of the whole world. And we have to have that vision and we have to have that commitment and compassion to do something for all of the world, to help everybody enjoy a good life so that uh, we can create peace in the world. But as long as we are selfish and self-centered, we will never be able to do that. So the effort that I am making, it's a very small effort. It's a drop in the ocean when you look at the whole problem. But it's, at least it's a drop. It's, a drop is better than no drop at all. And all of us can get involved in doing something to help the children of the world and to help the others uh, uh, who need help in, in our world. I said also earlier that we perpetuate violence through our parenting habits. People say, tell me very often that violence is human nature. There's nothing we can do about it. It's just going to be part of our nature. And I don't think violence is human nature. If it was human nature, we wouldn't need military academies and martial arts institutes to teach us how to fight and kill. The fact that we need these institutes to teach us indicates that this is a learned experience. But what is human nature, again, is anger. And what is not human nature is the way we abuse anger. So we need to learn about that and we need to use that energy positively. But the parenting aspect is where we plant the seeds of violence in our children, when we threaten them with punishment. We are controlling them through fear, the fear of punishment that we are capable of meeting out to them. And that fear controls us at every stage of our life. We are constantly afraid of the law, we are afraid of uh, the authority, we are afraid of the community, we are afraid of everything. And as long as we live in that fear, we are never going to be independent. We are never going to be free. We have to get out of that fear. We have to lo learn to love and respect each other. And it's only then that we will be able to be free and, and uh, in peace. In a culture of non-violence, and my parents practiced this at home, 
because they believed only in the philosophy of non-violence. We were not punished when my two sisters and I uh, misbehaved or did something wrong. We were not punished. They did penance. Our parents did penance. And it took the form very often of fasting. Depending on how serious the offense was, they fasted for a day or fasted for two days. But they sat at the table, they would feed us, they would cook the food and, and uh, sit there and, and feed us there. But they wouldn't eat and they would tell us why they are not eating. Because they were not good parents. They had not teach us, taught us the right way of behavior. And because the relationship between the parents and the children was one of love and respect, mutual love and respect, we felt awful when that kind of thing happened. And we made sure that it didn't happen again. And that is what we need to have between people. We need to have a relationship that's based on love and respect for each other. And it's only through that that we can then create a peaceful society. So these are some aspects of the philosophy of nonviolence that uh, I came to share with you this afternoon. And I'd like to conclude now with one final story that my grandfather was very fond of telling us. The story of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain. And everybody came there and did their best, but nobody could satisfy the king. And one day there was an intellectual from another town who came on a visit. And the king asked him the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he will not come to you, you will have to go to him and ask him this question. And so the next day the king went to this sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house and came with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace and he didn't want to show his ignorance. So he quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to his palace, found a little gold box and he placed that grain of wheat in the box. And every morning he would get up and open the box to find an answer and he couldn't find any answers. And then a few days later when this intellectual came back on a return visit, the king asked him to explain. He said, you sent me to the sage and the sage gave me this grain of wheat and I don't know what the grain of wheat has to do with peace. And that is when he said, it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish and that will be the end of the story. But if you had allowed this grain of wheat to interact with all the elements, if you had planted this outside in the soil, it would sprout and grow and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. That if somebody has found peace and if they keep it locked up in their hearts, it will perish with them. But if they let it interact, it would sprout and grow and very soon we could have a whole world of peacemakers. So I have come here this afternoon to give you the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather and I hope that you won't let it rot and perish but let it interact so that all of us together can transform this world and make it a better place for future generations. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer any questions if anybody has any. Um, <clears throat> can you talk about the common shift of consciousness and uh, any mysterious uh,
supernatural part of it. Shift in consciousness, global consciousness. Shift in global consciousness. Uh, well, a, a shift needs to happen in global consciousness. We have been uh, so dominated by the culture of violence that uh, our consciousness is also very violent. And I think a shift is very necessary and, uh, and you know, it's something again that every human being has to make that effort to make that global consciousness. It's not going to happen uh, by some miracle or it's not going to happen because somebody says so. It has to come from within. It has to awaken from within. Yes. Sir. Uh, your message always is uh, inspiring. My thought is, <clears throat> sure, living bees, nice to children. They're rather abstract. Um, you have a list of practical ideas, and of course, you travel all around, so that answer is different wherever you go ways that people can bring practice into everyday life. For example, don't watch television on Thursday. <laughs> or fast on Monday with an affirmation for improvement, etc. I'm just curious if you had that type of practical list that people could take home and put well, up and refrigerate it and say, I'm going to do this. I think the first practical thing that we need to do, as I said, is to do introspection, to find out where our weaknesses lie. We don't know our weaknesses and our strengths. It's only when we do that introspection that we would find out our weaknesses and we would be then be able to transform them to strength. So as long as we live uh, unconsciously, uh, we will never be able to discover that. So we need to do that introspection. Yeah. Introspection has to be done by the self. You got to look inside yourself and see what, where are your weaknesses. Others can't tell you that because they don't know you so well as you know yourself. And I, I don't mean to argue because I agree with you, I understand that. Mm. But to a lot of people, the word introspection is an abstract. So we're talking about journal writing, we're talking about how do you come Yeah, journal writing, journal. That, like I have to do, I have to inspect everything that happened during the day and put them down on that journal. You can put them down in a journal or you put them down on, uh, on a big paper on the wall, wherever you want to. But you have to look at your actions and inactions and put them down there and ask yourself whether this was the right thing to do or wrong thing to do. And when you come to that conclusion that it was the wrong thing to do, then how do you make it right? Yes. And you have to come to that work on yourself there. Nobody else is going to be able to tell you or, or make you do that until you yourself decide to do it. Yes. Um, when you're talking about uh, anger being a, a strong um, emotion like electricity, mm. uh, my take on it is that um, even personal, if um, you've experienced an injustice or you see an injustice, and every one of us has something that we can feel very strongly about, then it would seem to me the positive way to be is that the anger would be the motivating force to give you the courage to do whatever you could to change that injustice, mm -hmm. to do something positive about it, mm -hmm. instead of retaliating. Because many of us, if you see something happening, you think about what have, what brokenness has that person experienced to do this to me? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and nothing happens like in a vacuum. Usually people, uh, things happen out of brokenness, a broken society, a broken person, a situation, and the anger would be that I want to change that situation, I want to change that focus, I want to change that condition. Exactly, that's what I was saying. That we need to learn to use that anger positively and constructively, rather than abuse the anger and get angry and, uh, and 
use counter violence or seek revenge or something like that. Yeah. Um, you're saying introspective is abstract, but on the part of it is the children were younger. I mean, instead of all this stuff like, you know, the same violence that in life, my children, if they did something wrong or hurt somebody, I would have them take time out to think about what they did. And, you know, how it hurt, how they hurt them, what could they do to resolve this with the person they hurt, you know, different ways they can improve, things like that. And I think starting off someone when they're younger to talk about their actions, thinking if it comes natural, you should sort of, you know, develop as you get older. You know, my know, parents have me think about different things too. And I think so many times that people talk nothing about concrete. You do this, you do that. Do this, that. You have to sort of start at a younger age to sort of have people thinking about what they do and the choices they make and having to have time off to think about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can use the word in perspective with my children, but it's the same concept. I think when you start people out when they're younger to think about things, it helps them to to think about things that are only to get older. It's like a step process. Right. You know. Right. What about, uh, how about dealing with uh, deeper, more aggressed issues that uh, come up once uh, in a simil similar circumstances or similar triggers, uh, but uh, seem a, a little too painful to deal with? Uh, or, in other words, it, you think you deal with it, but just keeps coming up over. Well, it comes up over and over again because we don't deal with it right in the right way. And uh, so we need to uh, find out why is this happening and go to the depths of it and try to find an answer. And maybe sit and have a dialogue with them. If it is between two people, then have a dialogue with that person and say, well, let's find a way out of this and see where things are going wrong. But if we just live by ourselves and get more and more frustrated because this is not going to resolve anything, then uh, it will never resolve because we are not making that full attempt that we need to make. You said you made a Daniel, Daniel trip to India? Mm -hmm. What's that called? Gandhi Legacy Tour. When do you go? What time of year? It begins on the 29th of December and lasts to the 14th of January. So is there a way that people can just get involved to be part of the process to talk at? Or yes, uh, you can go to the website gandhiforchildren.org okay. and you'll get all the information on that. Oh, okay, thank you. I've also brought some books, uh, two books, uh, latest books that I've written. One is The Legacy of Love, and like you were told in the beginning. And I have dedicated the proceeds from the sales of these books to helping the poor children in the world. So all of the money goes directly to them. Nothing stays back with me. 100% goes to the children. So if any of you are inspired to buy those books, you may do so. And, uh, you'll be supporting a good cause. Yeah. Are you selling your autograph? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll sell the autograph and, and send the money to the poor, uh, cause for the poor. I don't want uh, money for myself. But if that helps more children, by all means, I'll, I'll sell it for five dollars. <laughs> The books are fifteen dollars. You can pay twenty dollars, and I'll, I'll sign it for you. <laughs> Mr. Gandhi, we have a gift actually for you yeah. that is going to be presented to you. This is a note from the uh, from the artist. Mm -hmm. This this picture is in the Smithsonian Museum. It's a famous print. It's a famous. It's a picture. And he was going to put you in to the poster as well. Oh my God. And it's on the back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. Show it to us. Yes. This is the. Uh, Yes, it's a humanity divi divinity print that was actually, uh, it's in the, uh, hanging in the White House, and it's also hanging in the Smithsonian, and it's, uh, 
It, the original artist, Mike Bryan, actually is, this is a gift giving to uh, Mr. Godney today and has included his now new image. This is a one of a kind uh, print here because he's added his image and, and the selection with his grandfather. And, Thank you very much. So any more questions? Yeah. That's it? All right. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to be here.